Good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome to this Stat Revise uh, GCSE web class on resultant forces for physics GCSE. I'm just going to wait a few more moments if anyone else wants to join us at the start. Okay, feel free to ask any questions in the chat as I go through. Um, I don't know if you can hear me yet. I'm just waiting for my streaming link to come back up and then we'll carry on. And if you can hear me yet, I'm just waiting for my streaming link to come back up and then we'll carry on. And if you can hear me yet, I'm just waiting for my streaming link to come back up and then we'll carry on. And if you can Right, <clears throat> so sorry about that. I'm hoping you can now hear me without any awful sound. Um, and I can get straight on now with this snap revised session on resultant forces. So let's move on. 
Um, so my name is David. I'm a physics teacher of about well, 18 years experience. Um, I also examine for AQA and at Excel and OCR. So I've got experience with the kinds of problems that students can face when they're answering questions and also what the exam boards like students to um, make sure they put into their answers. So we'll carry on now. So yeah, I teach GCSE. I have um, examined for IGCSE. I also teach A-level physics and I examine um, A-level and GCSE as well. So the objectives for today are that you should understand what's meant by resultant force on a system, determine resultant forces using a free body diagram, and also understand how to resolve a force into two components. So if we have a force at an angle, we can turn that into a force uh, vertically and a force horizontally, 90 degrees to each other. Uh, we're not going to be covering, um, it says here, calculating resultant force in 2D. Well, that kind of means is basically forces in more than one plane. So imagine all the forces we're going to be looking at are forces you could draw on the same plane on the same piece of paper. So we're not looking at that three dimensions. So AQA requires that you understand what scalar quantities are um, and what vector quantities are and be able to define the differences. And you should be able to describe systems of forces and examples of forces that act on a system or on isolated objects. Um, just a reminder, everything I cover today will generally be for higher tier students. Um, foundation students aren't expected to be able to find a resultant force in a straight line, so we're not going to spend too much time on that. And it's not covered in detail by other boards either. So at Excel students, they're not expected to be able to resolve forces into horizontal and vertical components, um, but they need to do the same regarding scalar and vector quantities and use vector diagrams to illustrate resolution of forces, draw and use free body diagrams and so on. We'll be going through this and OCR the same really pretty much as the other two boards. So what do we already know? Um, feel free to pop your answers in the chat. Sometimes there's a little bit of a lag, so I might start explaining before you've done that. But if you've got any questions as I go to ask. So in terms of vectors, how does a vector differ from uh, a scalar quantity? Well, vectors are any quantity um, which have both direction and size. So another word for size is magnitude. So any quantity which has both direction and magnitude is a vector quantity. Yep, vectors have magnitude and direction. Um, scalars only have a magnitude. So the magnitude in this case would be there. There's our magnitude. Just the length of that. But then on top of that, we've also got a direction here which could be an angle from the vertical and when you're stating angles when you're stating a direction in an answer you can use the context that the questions used um, such as north south east or west or up down left or right or i don't know in this case perhaps 30 degrees east of north could be your your um, direction but when you're quoting vectors you need to state both direction and magnitude so we've learned how to use arrows to represent forces and vectors as I've just said, the length of the arrow represents magnitude and the direction it's pointing in is the direction of the vector. Moving on to forces, um, forces are a push or a pull, sometimes a squash or a twist um, between objects that are either in contact or not in contact. Some forces act at a distance such as gravity, electrostatic forces and magnetism. So a push or a pull, um, between two or more objects and they can be contact or non-contact. And in the case here, we've got a hand pushing on a box. So we're gonna have a force in this direction to the right um, due to that push. So let's start with resultant forces now. So a resultant force for a set of forces um, on an object is defined as the single force which would replace all of the other forces acting. So the resultant force for a set of forces on an object is the single 
force which would replace all the forces acting on that object or that system. And that's the resultant force. So if we look at the two examples we've got here, um, bottom left there, we have a box with a force being applied from left to right and a force with a smaller magnitude being applied from right to left. So the resultant force here is going to be a weaker force to the right. We just add the lengths of the two vectors together. And as they're in opposite directions, we take the magnitude of the smaller vector away from the magnitude of the bigger vector. And we get one weaker force to the right. Just looking in the chat there. Um, so vector is what we have learned in maths as well. Yeah, there's a lot of crossover between maths and physics here. Sometimes the examples might differ, but it's the same uh, principles in involved, yeah. And on the right-hand side here at the bottom, we've got two forces which are both acting to the right, one of larger magnitude than the other. And in this case, because they're both acting right, we're gonna end up with one stronger force acting to the right. So these vectors are both acting in the same direction. So we add their magnitudes together and we've got one stronger force to the right. That would be the resultant force in that case. So when these forces are all lined up in one direction, so that either they're both horizontal or they're both vertical, it's simply the case of um, subtracting one from the other to get your resultant magnitude and the direction will be determined by whichever um, force is largest. Any questions on that so far, just pop them in the chat. Um, I'll move on to the idea of equilibrium. So when a system or an object is in equilibrium, that means that the resultant force acting on it is nothing, it's zero. And that means that all the forces, if there are forces acting on that object, they must cancel each other out. And we call that balancing. So the forces would be said to be balanced. So an object is in equilibrium if the forces acting on it are balanced. And so they cancel each other out. And we have an example of that bottom left on this side. So we have a force there to the right, and another force there to the left. And they're of about the same magnitude, well, exactly the same magnitude, but in opposite directions. So there is zero net force, net being what you get left over when you add everything up, two equal and opposite forces. Um, box doesn't move in this case, or well, it won't accelerate. It could be moving, of course, but it won't accelerate. So if it is moving, it won't change its speed. And if it's stationary, it won't start to move. Uh, and that leads me on to what happens when an object's in equilibrium. It will remain stationary or it will continue to move at constant velocity. And in the case of a parachutist falling there with a parachute open, we're going to have the weight of the parachutist acting from the center of mass downwards. There's our weight. And we're going to have drag acting upwards. There's our drag. And so when that parachutist is falling at a constant speed at that terminal velocity, the drag um, will match the weight. It will be equal, but opposite in direction. And so we get a constant speed of four. Because there is zero resultant force acting on the parachutist, the upward drag due to the air hitting the parachute is equal and opposite to the weight acting downwards. Okay, we'll discuss more about terminal velocity in a later class, um, but for now, let's move on and see how we feel about what we've covered so far. So has that been straightforward? Are there any questions at all? Anyone feeling unsure about anything that I've covered so far, please pop up a message in the chat if you would like me to just explain anything further. Um, okay, thank you, Winning. So the parachute will just float. Um, no, it will be falling because it has a, a mass 
uh, and it's acting that, that a mass is being acted upon by a gravitational field. So the parachute and the parachutist will be falling through the atmosphere, but um, the drag will be equal and opposite to the weight, so they will fall at a constant speed. Um, as I said, terminal velocity is something we'll cover in more detail in a later class. But just to give you a little bit more, before the parachutist opens their parachute, um, they still have the same total mass, of course, but they haven't got the added effect of the drag caused by the chute. So they'll be falling at constant speed once they've had time to accelerate, but they will be falling much faster. So the parachute essentially increases the drag on the parachutist and lowers the constant speed that the parachutist falls at. So you want to be landing at less than five meters per second, really, to avoid any broken angles when you're parachuting. So no one's said they're super confused. Um, thank you for the questions. And um, I shall move on to an example for you to have a look at. <clears throat> cool, so here we've got an example of an exam question. This is an OCR exam question, a higher level question. Um, it's actually from an old spec paper, but that doesn't really make much difference. Similar question could come up. So Simona goes for a ride in a hot air balloon and there's an upwards force on the balloon from the air around it. This force is called up thrust. Um, the balloon stays still in the air. Complete the sentence, choose from this list. The up thrust is something to the weight of the balloon. So if the balloon is staying still, because it is, in this case it is floating because we've got less dense air inside the uh, balloon structure itself. So if it's staying still, what words are missing then from this answer for our one mark in this case? If the resultant force is zero, there'll be no acceleration in any direction. In order for the resultant force to be zero in this case, the up thrust has got to be, whoops, the up thrust has got to be equal to, thank you winning, yeah, equal to the weight of the balloon. So that balloon will just, will just float in the air because there's an up thrust, which is the result of the air around the balloon envelope, which is gonna be equal and opposite to the weight. So I'll move on from that question to another example. Um, here we've got a truck towing a car along a level road at constant velocity. So the key term here is the constant velocity. If you see that in a question, it means that the system is in equilibrium. So there must be no resultant force. For that to be moving at constant velocity, there must be no resultant force. There are forces acting, but they work out to zero. They, they, if you sum them all together, they add up to nothing. So there's a tow rope attached to the truck and the car. Which of these shows the directions of the forces between the car and the tow rope? Put a cross in the box next to your answer. So the force exerted by the car on the tow rope and the force exerted by the tow rope on the car. So what do we think? Is it going to be A, B, C, or D? So the car is attached to the tow rope. The force exerted by the car on the tow rope is going to be one that is trying to resist forward motion. So that force has to be, thank you, Renning, you're on the right lines there. So yeah, indeed, that force has got to be to the right. So this one here, that's the force exerted by the car on the tow rope. It's pulling back on the tow rope. And the force exerted by the tow rope on the car must be pulling forwards on the tow rope, equal and opposite to the force of the car on the tow rope. So that means that this one here has got to be right. So the answer here is B for the first part of this question. Um, the truck has to provide a force of 4,000 newtons to the left to keep the car at a constant velocity. Complete the sentence by putting a cross in the box next to your answer. So what will the resultant force on the car be? The resultant force on the car which is moving at constant velocity. Again we've got that phrase, we've got that phrase there in the question which immediately needs to make you think about there being zero net force. So the answer to this one is going to be A. So the resultant force on the car is zero. It's being pulled 4,000 newtons one way, but it's pulling back 4,000 newtons the other way. So um, the answer there is C winning. Uh, the car 
um, is pulling back 4,000 newtons to the right, but because there's a 4,000 newton force to the left as well from the truck, the two forces in opposite directions being vectors, they cancel each other out to nothing, which is why the answer is A in this case, zero. Is that okay? Any questions on that, just pop them up again and I'll uh, come back to it. Okay, so that's resultant forces. Let's now have a look at free body diagrams. So the definition of a free body diagram. Thank you, thanks winning. Um, so the free body diagram basically shows all of the forces that are acting on an object as vector arrows. So it shows all the forces acting on an object as vector arrows. So you're going to draw on your vector arrows to illustrate all of the forces acting on an object. And you're normally dealing with single objects when you're talking about free body diagrams. Um, and we can find the resultant horizontal or vertical force by just looking at the forces that are in the same direction. So we look at the vertical forces, we look at the horizontal forces, and we can sum them up. Um, you choose one direction to be positive, whether that's left or right is often indicated by the context of the question. So we can find the resultant horizontal or vertical force by only looking at the forces in those directions. So to find the resultant vertical force, you just look at all the forces that are acting up and down, in this case, in this diagram, those ones. And to find the resultant horizontal forces, you just look at the forces that are acting left and right. And if we look at this diagram, um, let's label some of these forces up. So we've got a car, and we're assuming it's going to be on a road or something, some surface. So we're going to have a normal reaction force, a normal reaction force, which is going to be acting upwards. And that word normal um, just means it's at 90 degrees to the surface. So you've got your car on a flat surface and the reaction force going upwards is at 90 degrees to it. That's what the word normal means in this context. And then we've got downwards, we must have its weight. And then we have some kind of driving force which is acting to the right could be called a thrust in the case often thrust is used for aircraft and so on, but you could call it a thrust or a driving, a driving force. And then you've got a, a drag component which will act backwards, assuming the car is moving forwards. Um, so if we look at all that diagram, we'll look at all those forces we've drawn on there. We've got the normal reaction force is the same length as the weight. It's in the opposite direction. So vertically, there is zero resultant force because those two vectors cancel each other out. So that's nothing. Now, horizontally, we've got drag there, which is actually, um, it's a shorter arrow than the driving force here on the right. So we're going to have a resultant force to the right that way. Now, there's no numbers on here. We're just stating which direction the resultant force acts. There's no vertical resultant force and there's only a horizontal resultant to the right. So all in two dimensions, we're not worried about any forces sideways here, and you'll never be asked to work out anything that has those components in it. Let's have a look at a few more examples. So we've got a picture hanging on a wall, um, on a little nail there, Let's put the nail in, there we go. Um, now that picture is going to have weight, and the weight is going to act downwards from its center of mass, let's label that W. Um, now that weight needs to be balanced, but we haven't got a, a single vertical force. What we have is two, um, I'm going to draw them as arrows on the string there. We have two tensions in the string, one on each side. And those two tensions, because they're at an angle, they've got a vertical part and a horizontal part. So the vertical component of the tensions I'm going to call that TV. So the vertical part of those tensions, that must be equal to the weight if the picture isn't falling off the wall. 
Yeah, I don't teach IGCSE, but I do examine for it. Um, the content's very, very similar. Um, only the, the style of questions in IGCSE is quite different. Um, they tend to rely slightly less on English comprehension for understanding of um, contexts, uh, which is, is because of the nature of IGCSEs are often taken by students without English as a, as a primary language. Um, so our vertical force from the tension in the strings equals the weight. There's obviously a little force to the right from the tension on the left here. And there's a little force to the left from the tension on the right here, and they balance each other out. So there is zero horizontal resultant force here, and there's also zero vertical resultant force acting on our picture. And we'll come to how you might work out the components of these forces at an angle in just a moment. Let's have a look at our car. So we've got our reaction force upwards, our normal reaction force. We've got our weight acting downwards. Uh, we have a force uh, due to drag acting left. And we have a force due to uh, the driving force here. So I'm going to call that, I'll call this drag here. And I'll call this driving. Otherwise, I'm going to end up calling them both D. Right. So uh, the drag equals the driving force here. I've drawn my arrows. Um, approximately the same length and in opposite direction. So um, that means there is constant speed. Sorry for my handwriting there. Constant speed in that case. And the reaction force is equal to the weight. So there is no vertical resultant force either. So there's no horizontal resultant force or vertical resultant force. That car's going to be moving at constant speed. Just remember that when something's in equilibrium, it could be stationary as well as moving at constant speed. Um, so just make sure you read the question carefully to um, ascertain which is the case. Um, but essentially, if there's no resultant force acting on a body from Newton's laws, you can state that it will continue moving at the same speed and in the same direction until a resultant force acts and causes an acceleration. So let's have a look now at how we can find the resultant of a horizontal and vertical force. So if we've got two forces acting at 90 degrees, how can we find a single force that would serve the same effect? So we've got two forces acting at 90 degrees to each other. We want to find the one force that is equivalent to those two. So one of the things we can do, which is um, often asked, is to draw. So we can do this by drawing the forces as two vector arrows and we can do that to scale to scale so if we do it to scale we can assign a length to a certain force say one centimeter in newton or, or whatever to, determined by the, the, the forces you're dealing with and then we can draw um, a single arrow, a single vector from um, to form from from the end of one force to the end of the other. Um, so we can, I'll show you how to do this in a minute. So we can draw a single vector from each force to form the resultant, and it forms a vector triangle then. will be closed. I'll show you that in a second. And then the last part we need to do is we need to find the length of the resultant vector and also its angle from the horizontal or the vertical. So let's illustrate this. Um, let's say we've got a vertical force here and we'll say that's um, four centimetres long. And that's our upward force. So we're using uh, one centimetre equals one Newton here. So we draw this on our paper very accurately with a clear ruler, or we may be given a, a, a little piece of graph paper in the exam. And we've got a force to the right as well. So let me draw that. We've got a two Newton force to the right. 
So that's two centimeters long. And then we can join up the beginning of one of our force vectors to the tail, to, sorry, the tail of one force vector to the, the tip of the other. So if I start to draw from there and meet my four centimeter line there. Now, the length of that line we can then measure. So if we measure that, we find that will be 4.5 centimetres. So doing it all to scale and being very accurate with these drawings. The key is to be nice and accurate. Um, always take a sharp pencil in the exam and make sure you draw these nice and clearly. We also need to find the angle here. And we can do that using a clear protractor. And the angle there, if you draw this out, you'll find to be 63 degrees. So the length of the vector is important because we're choosing a scale. And here we started off by deciding that within the space we had here, um, obviously what I've drawn isn't to scale in terms of centimetres, but we've chosen one centimetre to be one Newton. So if we draw our four Newton upward force four centimetres long, and if we draw our two Newton right ways force two centimetres long, then we know that the diagonal line joining the two together if we measure it, we can then convert back from the length of that line to the force in Newtons. So the force here is going to be, as our scale is one Newton is one centimeter, it's gonna be 4.5 times one, because that's our, that's our scale. So that's gonna equal 4.5 Newtons, um, 63 degrees um, from the horizontal or to, to the horizontal, I would say. Sorry, I'm running out of room to write that in. So I'm going to disappear off up the side there. Sorry. So when we give an answer to find a resultant force, we just need to remember we're always quoting a magnitude and a direction. Um, that 63 degrees to the horizontal could equally be 27 degrees from the vertical, however you like. Um, no, they're, all, they're always going to be triangles. It's a good question winning. Thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, these force, these um, vector triangles are always going to form a closed triangle. Uh, when you're talking about forces that are at 90 degrees to each other, which in all cases you will be, you'll have one horizontal force, one vertical force. And um, draw them in the direction that you're told. Uh, make sure that the head of one of the arrows meets the tail of the other. And then a single line makes the hypotenuse of the triangle. And that will always be your resultant force. Um, you can have other cases. Um, uh, you could have angles other than 90 degrees between the forces, but you don't need to be able to do those at GCSE. So I hope that answers your question. I mean, these can get more complicated. Um, you can have more than two forces acting. If we added another force on, which was, um, I don't know, say two Newtons downwards. So if we wanted to add a two Newton downward force onto our four, we've got three forces there then we'd have to draw our, our straight line from there to there, and that would be our resultant. Okay. So let's have a look at resolving forces. So a fo um, we can go from a resultant to our horizontal and vertical components, and that's called resolving. So finding the resultant is finding the single force that would act in the same way as uh, all the other forces acting. And resolving a force is finding the horizontal and vertical components um, of a vector. So a force can be resolved by finding horizontal and vertical vectors um, for which it is the resultant. So we're starting with a resultant here, and then we're working backwards. So we do that by drawing first um, horizontal and vertical arrows from the ends of the vector. I'll show you how to do that in a minute. And then we measure the lengths of those horizontal and vertical arrows 
and use the scale that we've chosen to find the magnitude of the two forces. So the last thing we need to do is measure the lengths and apply uh, our scale, whichever scale we've chosen to use. So let's pick a slightly awkward scale for this one. There's our, um, our resultant force we've got there, and we want to resolve our three Newton resultant force here. We want to resolve that into a vertical and a horizontal component. So I'll try and do this as best I can freehand. We draw a horizontal line across, which will be the magnitude of our horizontal component. And then we draw a vertical line here, which will be the magnitude of our vertical component. Now let's say that we've drawn this line uh, 4.5 centimetres long. Makes it a bit awkward in terms of scale. It means that one centimetre is equal to three over 4.5 newtons, which is equal to two thirds of a newton. So it's a pretty awkward scale. I wouldn't, I wouldn't go out of my way to do this in an exam. Um, so one centimetre is two thirds of a newton. So if we now measure our nicely drawn to scale horizontal and vertical components, we'll find that this vertical component will be 2.3 centimetres and our horizontal component will be uh, 3.8 centimetres. Now obviously these are lengths, they're not forces, we need to apply our scale. And there's our scale factor. So one centimetre is two thirds of a newton. So horizontally, we are going to get 3.8 times two thirds. And two thirds of 3.8 is 2.6 newtons. So there's, there's our force here, 2.6 newtons going horizontally. And then vertically, we've got our length of 2.3 centimetres, multiply that by our scale factor of two thirds, and that equals 1.5 newtons. So this is 1.5 newtons. That length of 2.3 centimetres, is it means that there's 1.5 newtons acting vertically. And, and that's how you resolve the vertical and horizontal forces from a single resultant force. There's quite a lot in that one and quite a lot to take in there. Um, you may want to have another look at this and you're able to download the notes and obviously rewatch as well if you need to go, to go back. If you've got any questions, please pop them in the chat. Um, the, the value of doing this is that if you do have a force that's acting at an angle and you have some other forces that are acting vertically and horizontally, you can turn all of your forces in the problem into vertical and horizontal forces. So you're turning this awkward angled force into a nice simple vertical and horizontal. And then you can sum your vertical forces and your horizontal forces into two final vertical and horizontals, and then you can find a further resultant force. Quite many steps in that. You're not going to be asked to do all of those things in one question, but these can be used to solve more complicated problems. Can you use tangent if the vertical and horizontal are given as well? Um, you can use um, trigonometry to solve these problems. Um, so we're resolving a resultant force into vertical and horizontal components here. If I know the resultant force, in this case, it's three newtons, and I know the angle of, of that force from the horizontal, um, then I can use cosine, sine, tangent, at will, depending on which angle I've been given and which side I've been given. So yes, you, you can use trigonometry um, in order to find a resultant. Of course, here we've been doing the opposite. We've been resolving a resultant into vertical and horizontal. But in order to find a resultant, if you've got two forces at right angles to each other, of course, you can use Pythagoras theorem as well. Um, um, you may well be asked to find a resultant and not told how to do it. So you can then choose according to your ability and skill, what, what's the best way for you to do it. Um, but if you are asked to use a scale diagram to find the resultant, or in this case, to find the resolved vertical and horizontal components, then you must use a scale diagram. If you're not given the, that instruction, then you can use um, any means you can to get to the right answer. Trigonometry, Pythagoras will work as well. But it's important you need to you need to be able to draw scale diagrams even at a level it's a skill that's required and sometimes tested in the exams and uh, students are particularly asked to draw a scale diagram okay <clears throat> so let's have a look at a few more examples and um, find the resultant of a four newton force to the left 
and a three newton downward force. So let's draw my four newton force to the left. There we go. And I'm going to draw a three newton downward force there. I'm going to just label that four newtons and I'm going to label this one three newtons. Um, thanks for reading. I hope that's clear. So we've got our horizontal line. Now I'm going to choose a much more sensible scale here. Let's say I say two centimetres is equal to one newton. And we need to think how long is our four newton line going to be, will it? We needed to have drawn that eight centimetres long. And our three newton line needs to be six centimetres long. And now we can draw our resultant force from tip to tail there, nice and accurately, making sure they meet perfectly. And if we measure that, um, we've got a three, four, five triangle here for those of you who are mathematically uh, inclined, because we've got six, eight. So that means this is going to be 10 centimetres long. Now you would find that by measuring it accurately with a clear ruler. So if we apply our scale, two centimetres is one newton, and we've been asked to find the resultant, the resultant is going to be 10 times, um, sorry, two centimetres is one, 10 divided by two. And 10 divided by two is five newtons. And um, technically to complete that question, we would also measure the angle there. And so we'd need to add our angle in, in degrees. And I would probably say um, down from horizontal, something like that. When you describe an angle, you just need to give a, a start point. So you could say X number, if I put in X for the angle there, um, you could say X degrees south and west, or you could say just X degrees down from horizontal. Okay, brilliant, okay, yep, five newtons, using our scale, nice scale drawing and applying. And here we've chosen a sensible scale to make our maths easier. Don't try and work out a scale that works out to two thirds of a centimeter a newton, if you can avoid it. Let's do the next one. So the tension in a rope is six newtons and it's directed to the right at 20 degrees above the horizontal. So we've got something that looks like this. There's um, six newtons there going up to the right 20 degrees. And we want to find the horizontal and vertical components of the tension in that rope. So there's tension in, whoop, there's tension in that rope. Let me I'll draw an arrow for tension. So we draw the horizontal line in. That's the horizontal component. And then we draw our vertical component in. Um, and we can draw our angle in, that's uh, 20 degrees there. So I'm going to use the same scale. I'm going to pop this scale across to this one as well. So this line here is going to be 12 centimetres long. And so I'm then going to accurately measure my horizontal and vertical components. And I find my vertical component is 4.1 centimetres. And my horizontal component is 9.69, I think, 9.69 centimetres. Um, and then we can work out what our forces are by applying our scale. So we need to half the centimetres to get to newtons because two centimetres is one newton. So we've got 2.05 newtons vertically and horizontally, uh, we're going to have half of that. So that's uh, six point, no, that should be 9.69, my apologies there, 9.69. So um, if we halve 9.69, we get 4.5, 4.85 roughly, don't we? Do this on a calculator, 4.85 newtons or thereabouts horizontally. So we just convert back from our length to our force using our scale. I hope that's clear um, and that I'm giving you enough detail in the examples here. Um, so from that, just to ask you the question, how are you are feeling about what we've done there? Um, are you finding that relatively straightforward? Um, you can always pop a number, one, two or three in the chat. to give me an idea of how well you're um, understanding the way I'm explaining it. And if you need me to uh, explain it differently to help you understand it. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, um, you can still pop a one, two or three in the chat. It's a little bit laggy, um, I'll, I'll keep my eye on it. Thank you, Winning. Um, and if you have any other questions as I go, just let me know. Let's move on and do um, final few examples here. 
Um, so we've got four questions here to have a look at, applying what we've been through. Um, so this diagram shows the forces acting a helicopter, acting on a helicopter in level flight. Now, if I was just a bit of exam technique, I would be inclined to, to sort of highlight the fact that it's in level flight. OK, in level flight, which means that vertically it must be in equilibrium. Describe the resultant force acting on the helicopter. So we need to explain vertically and horizontally. We've got two marks to gain here, and we've got two directions to deal with, the vertical and the horizontal. So I deal with vertical, first of all, in this case. Um, vertically, I'm using shorthand here, I'm using a little up arrow. It's probably better in an exam for you to write the word vertically, just to remove any um, doubt for the examiner. So vertically, we've got 12 kilonewtons. Upwards, I'm going to say upwards is positive, and downwards is negative. I've just made that arbitrarily. Um, so we've got to take away 12 kilonewtons from 12 kilonewtons, and that's going to be zero newtons. So vertically, there is no force acting. Those two 12s, 12,000 newtons, cancel each other out. And then horizontally, Um, I'm going to say that left is positive and I'm going to say that right is negative. And again, it doesn't matter which way around you choose. It makes sense to choose the direction where you're going to end up with the resultant force as being the positive direction. So there we're going to have uh, three kilonewtons to the left, take away the two kilonewtons of friction to the right. And we've got 1,000, one kilonewtons there, um, which is acting left. So I need to add that word left or to the left there. Otherwise, I'm not describing that force correctly because force is a vector. It doesn't matter with this one because it's zero, so it doesn't act in any direction. But with the second one, you've got to remember to quote state the direction as well. So yeah, one kilonewton to the left is the correct answer there for two marks. Let's have a look at another example here. Um, so racing car teams track the progress of cars to analyze their performance. And here are some of the forces acting on a car um, shown in the diagram below. Um, the team has force sensors on the car. And at one moment, the sensors measured the following forces, calculate the resultant force on the car, including its direction. So a nice, easy question really as well. We've got A acting in opposite sense to C. I'm just gonna label these up. So A is 6,400, C is 6,400. Uh, should put the unit there as well. Um, so the resultant force uh, vertically is zero. So I'm just going to make a little note there. There's no resultant force vertically. The, the answer to the question is one force and one direction. So we know that now we've worked out the vertical force is zero. We're going to have just a, a horizontal force. So B is equal to 18 kilonewtons, 18,000 newtons. And D is 11.5 kilonewtons, 11 and a half. So the resultant force there, horizontally, is going to be 18 minus 11.5, which is going to be uh, 6,500 newtons, isn't it? Sorry, there should be a decimal point there. 6,500 newtons, that's our resultant force. We've got units of newtons here, so I'm not going to leave it in kilonewtons. Yeah, and it's going to be to the right. So we just need to write in the word right there. Probably get away with an arrow to the right, but I would suggest you write the word as well. And that's a question from OCR old spec, a higher, high level question. Um, the previous question was uh, also OCR. And let's have a look at um, a third example. So this one is showing a, a boat towing a small dinghy. And we've got yeah, B was to the right, LK. So yeah, that's correct as well. You could stay direction B, um, you'd get the mark for that as well. Um, so back to the question we're looking at now. Um, so we've got a boat towing a small dinghy. We've got a rope there with a tension force in it. It's clearly at an angle. The tension force in the tow rope causes a horizontal force forwards and a vertical force upwards on the dinghy. And it gives you what those two forces are. Draw a vector diagram to determine the magnitude of the tension force in the tow rope and the direction of the force this causes on the dinghy. So we're not going to draw this diagram in this space here. We haven't really got room. 
well, we've got this horizontal force there and we've got this vertical force like that. We will be given, in this case, <clears throat> a piece of graph paper. So in order to do this, we're going to draw this nicely to scale. Um, let's have a look at our numbers here. So let's choose a scale. Let's say one big square is equal to uh, one centimetre, usually in your graph paper. And we'll make that equal to 25 newtons because of the numbers we have here. That means it will fit onto our paper. So one big square is one centimetre is 25 newtons. Um, and we've got a line here, we've got, hang on, let's have a look. We've got a horizontal force forwards of 150 newtons. So forwards was to the left. 150 newtons is six centimetres, isn't it? Six times 25 is 150. And the horizontal force forwards was to the left. So we need a six centimetre line. Let me try and draw it accurately for you. One, two, three, four, five, six. And that's to the left, there we go. So that line is six centimetres long, and that means it's 150 newtons. So we've done that. Then we need to add in our vertical force, and that is 50 newtons. So that's going to be two centimetres long. Starting now, one, two, there we go. Uh, two centimetres, and that represents uh, 50 newtons there. And then we're being asked to find the resultant. So we need to draw our line from the tip to the tail. There we go. And there is our resultant, there is our angle. And if we measure now, we can't use the graph grid here to find the length of the line at an angle. We need to measure it with a ruler. But these squares are each um, one centimeter long. Um, if we measure this with a ruler, we will get an accurate measurement of 6.3 centimetres. And then the calculation we need to do to find the magnitude of that tension, which is there, is going to be 6.3 times our scale, 25 newtons. So that is going to be 157.5. So that's our answer there. I'm just going to move that across because I drew that a little bit close. 157.5 newtons. And then we would measure the angle here using a protractor and find it to be 18 degrees. So that would be our answer for the direction. Um, and I would just say from the horizontal to give it some kind of um, direction. Don't just state an angle. It's 18 degrees from the horizontal there. So that's how we do with that. Um, are there any questions on scale drawing? Um, from being given two vectors, two components of a force, 150 horizontally, 50 vertically, and then drawing them to scale to find the resultant force. And that's going to be about as difficult as it gets. Um, so just remember when you're describing the direction of a vector, you use an angle, you should always specify what you're comparing the angle to, horizontal, vertical, north, south, east or west, whatever the question's context helps you to use. So. Um, I'm hoping we've covered our objectives now. Um, hopefully you can now understand what's meant by a um, resultant force. A resultant force on a system is the single one force that has the same effect as all of the forces acting on the system when you've taken them all into account. And you can determine resultant forces using free body diagrams. So that's where you have your object and you label on your object all the forces acting and you can decide in which direction the object's going to move. In this case, it's going to go that way, isn't it? So you can turn multiple forces acting on a body with a free body diagram into resultant forces. And understand how to resolve a force into two components. So when you've got resultant force, you now know how to, by drawing two vectors, turn that into a vertical and a horizontal component. So do you have any questions for me? Please, we've got a few minutes now. If you want to put any questions in the chat, I'm more than happy to help you further with anything I've gone through. And thanks for your input, everyone. Um, uh, all, the, all the answers I've had in the chat have been correct. Um, a couple of good questions as well. It's always helpful because it normally helps everyone um, and those who are quietly watching without asking questions it normally benefits you. Okay, 
Um, so it just uh, leaves me to say to you, um, keep an eye out for the upcoming web classes. Um, set your reminders if you want to join us. So we've got a physics web class on thinking distance. That's on the first, uh, sorry, the 9th of January. And um, there's a chemistry web class on tests for gases on the 16th of January. 30th of January, we've got maths, graphing. And then 6th of February, we've got um, changing atomic models, which uh, will be me presenting again for the GCSE. Okay, thank you very much and enjoy the rest of your day.